Welcome to the NC Choices webinar series, Teaching Tools for Beginning Farmers, funded by the United States Department of Agriculture's Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development. I am Heather Glennon, Assistant Professor at the University of Mount Olive, and I am going to present the module on Small Ruminant Production. This is one of seven modules offered in this webinar series. In this presentation, we will talk about small ruminant feeding and nutrition. If you are interested in the other resources offered by NC Choices, you can find out more on our website or our YouTube channel. We will be covering the ruminant animal, the six essential nutrients, how to feed your animal from birth to death, common forages, and grazing systems. A ruminant animal has a four compartment stomach. The rumen houses microorganisms that break down feedstuffs. Feed passes through the reticulum to the rumen and then back up the esophagus to be rechewed several times. A ruminant spends many hours a day chewing its cud. The omasum grinds feed particles and absorbs water, while the abomasum secretes hydrochloric acid to digest nutrients. Digesta then moves to the small intestines for further breakdown and absorption. The rumen makes up 50 to 60 percent of the stomach area. Millions of bacteria, protozoa, and fungi live in the rumen. Bacteria are the most populous. The bugs prefer the rumen pH and the environment to stay stable, so any ration changes should be made gradually. Microbes secrete the enzymes necessary for cellulose degradation so that sugars and proteins can be released from the plant cell wall. The microbes use many of these nutrients for their own functions. Microbes turn feedstuffs into volatile fatty acids and amino acids, which provide energy and protein to the animal. When microbes die, they are washed into the abomasum where they become a high quality protein source for the animal. There are six essential nutrients necessary for proper livestock nutrition. They are water, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, and vitamins. Water is the most important nutrient, especially for lactating animals. It helps regulate body temperature and carries nutrients in the blood to the body tissues. For every pound of dry feed, an animal may drink two to five pounds of water. Fresh forages may contain up to 85% water in the spring so animals may not drink supplemental water very much when they are grazing these lush forages. Water needs to be fresh, clean, easily accessible, and cool in the summer months. Grains such as corn, wheat, and barley are high energy concentrated feeds. Feedstuffs such as soybean meal and cottonseed meal are high in protein. All of these are low in fiber, which makes them highly digestible. Roughages, such as pastures and hays, are higher in fiber and lower in digestibility. Small ruminants are generally not fed silages. To reduce costs and take advantage of the ruminant digestive system, diets should be based around forages. A diet that is 100% forage may meet the nutritional requirements for several production stages. Small ruminants in late gestation, early lactation, or high growth periods may require supplemental energy or protein. Remember to make changes to the ration slowly so that the rumen microbes can adjust. Energy is the nutrient needed in the greatest quantity and can't always be met with forages. Dietary carbohydrates, proteins, and fats can provide energy. Excess energy is stored as fat. Small ruminants store fat internally around the kidneys and heart. 
Their meat is not as marbled as cattle. Corn, barley, wheat, and oats are very common energy feeds. Energy feedstuffs are high in phosphorus and low in calcium, which can lead to urinary calculi in males. The ideal calcium to phosphorus ratio for a monogastric, such as a pig or a chicken, is one to one, while the ideal calcium to phosphorus ratio for a ruminant is two to one or four to one, meaning that you need twice as much calcium in the ration as phosphorus. Many grass forages will fall into this range. Legumes are higher in calcium than grasses. Diets that are low in calcium or the inability to resorb calcium from bones can lead to milk fever in pregnant and lactating animals. This chart shows the energy values of common feedstuffs as percent TDN or total digestible nutrients. You can see that it is outlined in a red box. Grains are higher in TDN than forages. So if we look at the top, we see that barley, corn, oats, and wheat range from 76 to 88 percent TDN while fescue pasture and Bermuda grass hay may be as low as 53 to 64% TDN. But the calcium to phosphorus ratio is more ideal for the forages versus the grains. Fats and oils provide two and a half times more energy than carbohydrate feedstuffs, such as the grains. Sunflowers, cottonseed, flaxseed, and soybeans fall into this category. Fats and oils should make up less than 5% of the diet as to not negatively affect fiber digesting rumen microbes. Fats may be added in early lactation to provide additional energy to offset negative energy balance. Supplemental proteins can be expensive. Soybean meal, urea, fish meal, cottonseed meal, alfalfa hay, protein tubs, or peas and beans can provide supplemental protein. Excess dietary protein is converted to energy or excreted in urine and feces on the pasture. In a pasture system, the addition of legumes can increase an animal's protein intake. Crimson clover is a cool season annual while red clover, alfalfa, and white clover are considered biennials or perennials. Some legumes, like white clover, can lead to bloat in sheep and goats, especially if they make up more than 50% of the dry matter intake. The protein value of legumes can exceed 20% crude protein, which is above most animal needs. Excess protein will be excreted in urine and feces and used by other forages in the pasture. If we look at the slide, going from left to right, we see crimson clover, red clover, alfalfa, and white clover. This chart shows the crude protein values of common feedstuffs as percent CP. Corn is very low in crude protein, while legumes such as soybean meal and alfalfa are high in crude protein. Corn is very high in energy and very low in protein, so it is used in rations to provide energy, while the legumes or some of the other grains such as wheat and oats may provide more protein. If we compare the energy and protein values of haze, Alfalfa would be highest in protein because it is a legume. Bermuda grass, a warm season perennial, is usually lowest in energy and protein due to the lower ratio of leaf to stem. The nutrient analysis of tall fescue, timothy, or orchard grass hay would be dependent upon the level of nitrogen fertilization and the stage of maturity at harvest. 
Some North Carolina soils are deficient in selenium, copper, or cobalt. Supplemental minerals may need to be offered to pastured animals. Sheep are more sensitive to copper and can die from ingesting a toxic level of soluble copper, such as copper sulfate. Selenium is an essential element that has a narrow margin of safety and can also be toxic to livestock. Some questions to ask yourself would be, should minerals be available free choice or should they be hand fed several times a week? Should you provide a trace mineral block or a loose form? Animals will generally eat more minerals if it is offered in a loose form. Should minerals be offered by themselves on pasture or mixed in with supplemental feed? And also, how will you keep the minerals out of the weather, such as the rain, or free from manure? As we all know, small ruminants like to stand in their buckets. Nutrient requirements will depend upon the species that you are feeding, the size or weight of your animal, the sex, age, genetics, stage, and level of production. We also have to take into consideration the climate, the environment, and the activity level of the animals you are raising. And last but not least, we would feed depending upon the animal's current body condition gore. Nutrient requirements change from birth to death as animals go through the many stages of production. We need to feed our animals differently, whether they are being bred, are pregnant, are milking, are growing, or are just maintaining their body weight. We will now discuss a few important points to feeding small ruminants as their production stages change. It is imperative that newborns drink colostrum to receive antibodies passive immunity from their mothers to stay healthy. An animal should drink at least 10% of their body weight in colostrum within 24 hours of birth. After 24 hours, the antibodies are not as easily absorbed by the intestines. It is helpful to have frozen colostrum on hand just in case the mother dies or does not have enough colostrum for their offspring. For the first few weeks of life, lambs and kids will exclusively nurse from their mothers. To increase growth rate and rumen development, a creep feeder can be placed in the pasture that allows young stock access to supplements that are high in energy and protein. You will need to watch for older animals as they will try to get into the creep feeder and may get stuck. As an animal's weight and rate of gain increases, so does its requirement for energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. We have to be careful not to feed excess energy from carbohydrates and fats as they will be stored internally in the animal. Dry matter intake for growing boar-type meat goats ranges from 3 to 4 percent of their body weight. For example, a 55-pound kid Gaining a third of a pound of gain per day needs to eat two pounds of dry matter. This ration needs to be 66.7% TDN, or total digestible nutrients, and 14.5% crude protein. If this kid is eating a fescue clover pasture that is 75% water, they would need to eat eight pounds of fresh forage just to get two pounds of dry matter. The dry matter intake for growing lambs ranges from 3 to 5 percent of their body weight. The University of Maryland has developed Excel spreadsheets that summarize the nutrient requirements for sheep and goats using the 2007 National Research Council's recommendations. There are also worksheets that allow you to input your forages and nutrient values and calculate if your pastures are meeting your animal's needs. Flush ewes and does for two to three weeks before the breeding season by increasing the plane of nutrition. This can increase the ovulation rate and the embryo implementation. High quality pasture and or supplemental feed can also be fed. Keep feeding animals well for a month into the breeding season for best embryo implantation. 
70% of the fetal growth takes place in the last six weeks of gestation. Energy requirements can be 50 to 75% higher than in early gestation, so they're most likely going to be deficient. Some things to keep in mind, the rumen capacity is decreasing in these animals. They will have lower voluntary feed intake, so we will need to provide a higher quality diet, a more nutrient dense diet. Another thing to keep in mind is that a higher protein intake will help these does and ewes fight off parasite infections. Ewes and does in late gestation that are not being fed adequate energy in their ration are at a risk for pregnancy toxemia before delivery or ketosis after delivery. These are metabolic disorders caused by low glucose concentrations in the blood. Toxemia or ketosis is caused by a buildup of excess ketones in the blood, urine, and milk due to incomplete metabolic breakdown of fat. Most fetal growth takes place during the last trimester of pregnancy. So animals that are too thin, too fat, or carrying multiple fetuses can be affected. An energy-dense diet is recommended due to the limited space within the animal to hold feed. Underfeeding nutrients during pregnancy can also lead to small, weak offspring, poor milk production, and lower weight gains. You may also have higher neonatal mortality. Overfeeding nutrients during pregnancy increases the risk for dystocia, or difficulty giving birth. The lambs or kids may be too large for easy delivery. This graph depicts the relationship of milk yield, body weight, and feed intake of a lactating female from the time she gives birth until the time she dries off. In early lactation, she cannot eat enough nutrients to support her milk production, so she uses her body stores and loses condition. In mid-lactation, her feed intake catches up with her production and her body condition score begins to increase. As she nears the end of her lactation, she has less demand for calories and may put on higher body condition. Raising small ruminants on pasture can be very economical in North Carolina. Tall fescue and Bermuda grass are the most common perennial forages in the state. The percent TDN, or total digestible nutrients, and the percent crude protein of forages heavily depends on the stage of maturity at which it is grazed or harvested. Young vegetative leafy forages such as that seen in the left-hand picture, are higher in quality than more mature plants with a thick stem and seed head. The young plants are also more palatable and the animals will eat more of them. Goats are natural browsers because they evolved in arid regions of the world where browse provided the bulk of the feed. Goats can even stand on their hind legs to reach higher in the canopy so they prefer browsing over grazing. And when turned into a mixed pasture, they will go for the broadleaf weeds before they start eating the grass. Other goat grazing behaviors include grazing along fence lines before going into the center of the pasture and foraging on rough and steep land versus flat, smooth land. Goats are very uniform grazers in that they graze from the top of the canopy down to the soil. Sheep prefer to graze grasses but will eat broadleaf weeds and browse. When not managed properly, sheep have been known to graze close to the ground and kill desirable forage species. This chart depicts the growth curves of cool season forages. Peaks occur between March and May and September and November. Perennial grasses and legumes are listed in brown. Annual grasses and legumes are listed in green. 
Brassicas, such as turnips and radishes, are considered forbs. The animals will eat the green tops as well as the underground tubers of turnips and radishes. Legumes have a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria in the soil that enable the plants to fix their own nitrogen. Therefore, you would not need to buy as much fertilizer to use on legume species. This list is not all inclusive, but shows commonly planted forages in North Carolina. This chart depicts the growth curve of warm season forages. Most growth happens between May and September. Perennial grasses and legumes are listed in orange. Annual grasses and legumes are listed in black. So if your goal is to provide year-round grazing, you would want to plant a mix of cool season and warm season forages in your pasture. Ideally, producers will plant a combination of cool and warm season forages to graze for as long as possible during the year. In the Piedmont and mountains, cool season forages should cover approximately 75% of the area with warm season forages covering 25% of the area. In southeastern North Carolina, where temperatures are higher, warm season forages may need to make up a larger proportion of the pasture. If legumes constitute at least 30% of the forage dry matter, supplemental synthetic nitrogen may not be needed due to nitrogen fixation. The most common cool season perennial grasses include tall fescue, orchard grass, bluegrass, and ryegrass. Animals should begin grazing these grasses when they are between 6 to 8 inches tall. Try not to graze these grasses below 4 inches. Leaving substantial leaf blade allows for faster regrowth. Infective parasite larvae can be found between 1 to 3 inches above the soil on the leaf blades. So if you don't graze down into that 1 to 3 inches, you will limit the risk of parasite infection. Cool season annual forages can be grown as monocultures or a mixture of grasses, legumes, and brassicas. On the left is raised crazy mix that contains many different grasses, legumes, and brassicas. On the right is a purple top turnip. In addition to providing high quality feed, brassicas naturally till the soil and allow for better water infiltration. There are many varieties of Bermuda grass grown in North Carolina. While it can be lower in protein and energy values than cool season forages, Bermuda grass is very high yielding and can meet the nutritional requirements of several stages of animal production. Bermuda grass can be grazed very short, down to two inches, without hurting the stand. Common warm season annual grasses include pearl millet, Sudan grass, forage sorghum, and crabgrass. The first three should be allowed to grow until they are 18 inches tall before grazing begins. Leave six to eight inches of residue. Many pastures will have crabgrass naturally growing or you can plant it. It is very high quality. There are only a few warm season legumes that can be used in pasture systems. Cowpeas, soybeans, and sun hemp are very high in protein, but they are very slow to regrow after grazing so you may only be able to graze them once or twice during the summer. Cerecia lespedeza is very high in tannins, which can decrease the detrimental effects of internal parasites and should be included in almost all small ruminant grazing systems. During the hot summer months, small ruminants can be kept in woodlots to clear browse. They appreciate the shade and the high quality feed. Overstocking woodlots, such as more than four animals per acre, will prevent browse from regrowing quickly. This is great if you are clearing land, but not so much if you want the browse to last several times over the season. There are several different grazing systems that can be implemented for ruminants. Continuous grazing has the lowest utilization or the most wasted forage. Animals are kept in one pasture and never moved. This leads to overgrazing and large piles of animal waste in common areas around gates, 
under shade or near water sources. This is a picture of overgrazing due to continuous grazing. This has led to soil erosion, weed growth, and lower quality and quantity of our desirable forages. Rotational grazing systems involve moving animals through a series of paddocks based on available forage. Forage utilization is much higher in rotational systems versus continuous systems. Rotation allows forage to regrow and maintain a strong stand. Extra forage growth that is not needed for grazing can be used for hay production. Intensive or strip grazing involves moving animals through small paddocks every one to three days. Forage utilization is the highest in this system. If a producer moves animals every three days, they may need 10 paddocks or more to provide a 30-day rotation between grazing events. Some of the challenges for this type of system are providing water and shade in each paddock and moving fences on a regular basis. Strip grazing allows the producer to provide the most high quality forage to livestock. Animals should be moved to new forage when they have grazed their existing forage down to three to four inches as seen in the photo above of tall fescue and white clover. Again, summer forages may have different heights that need to be grazed down to.